we've already discussed the fact that Jesus came and he was proclaiming a message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And crowds are gathering around Jesus. People are gathering around him to listen to his teaching. And he gathers them here on the side of a mountain in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 opens with Jesus sitting down, taking on the posture of a Jewish rabbi, and he opens his, his mouth teaching. And the first words that come out of his mouth are these words, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is beginning to outline an answer to one of their core questions. What kind of people, what kind of people will benefit from Jesus' coming kingdom? And this word blessed would be a word that they would recognize. It's a wisdom word. It's, it's from the book of Psalms as well as from the book of Proverbs. This is a people who God looks at and says, these are my kind of people. These are the people, Max Lucado says, that I, that I applaud. And as Jesus begins to outline these eight, really nine beatitudes, these nine blessed statements, the picture looks upside down. It's not what you would expect the picture of his people, who are those who will be his in his kingdom. In fact, it's not even what we would expect. They are very, very much countercultural. We would say things like this. Blessed are those who can take care of themselves, who don't need anyone else. Blessed are those who are confident. Blessed are those who are hungry in life for success. Blessed are those who are comfortable. Blessed are those who have everyone who loves them and likes them. Blessed are the celebrities. But Jesus starts out, blessed are the poor in spirit. I, I imagine that, that caused the crowds to look up with a little bit of a, a curiosity. It's, it's not only countercultural for us, I believe it was countercultural for them. Jesus was coming, and even in this opening statement, proclaims that he's coming for a people that, that were an unlikely people. We need to ask the question as we begin today, what, what is meant by this word blessed? We, we don't really speak this way. We might even say blessed. This word is actually difficult to translate. We have a difficult time coming up with an exact equivalent that captures what Jesus is doing. Uh, some other possible translations that are possible equivalents would be happy. But of course, for us, that word means too much of an emotion. Maybe another word would be the word fortunate. Uh, fortunate is the person. But the ir irony of this term and the irony of this concept is that whether it's this original audience or us, none of us would see these people as being happy or fortunate or blessed. And yet what we discover is that it is not because of what they have done, but it, it's because of part of the nature of what's going on in their heart that causes them to be blessed. Why? Because they're ready to receive his kingdom. They are a people who are ready to repent, ready to align themselves with Jesus. They're a people who will most benefit from his coming kingdom. These eight beatitudes, these eight, and again, really nine beatitudes, outline a, a heart that is cultivated and ready for the seed of the gospel to be planted inside of it. And so Jesus goes on and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is a spirit that is in need. This word poor has Old Testament roots that, that grow and continue in the New Testament time to mean someone who's dependent upon someone else, someone who needs a benefactor. The poor in spirit, blessed are they, fortunate are they, happy are they. How is that true? How is that a description of his people? Well, because it's those people who recognize they need a king. They need a savior. Who recognize that in their own spirit, they are bankrupt, they are poor. It's those who will most readily receive Jesus as their king and they will be his people. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, we could go on and we begin to recognize that, that Jesus, as he outlines this, doesn't get any uh, more readily to receive when it comes to what we would normally expect. But he says this, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. John Stott translates it this way. Happy are the unhappy. And 
Jesus again would go, yeah, because these are the kind of people who need hope. These are the kind of people who recognize their need for the resurrection, their need for a kingdom, their need for justice, their need for more, their need for mercy. Blessed are those who mourn. They mourn their own sinfulness and they they mourn the brokenness that is the world that they live in. Blessed are those who, who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who have perhaps an accurate view of themselves. As Philippians 2 says, when comparing Jesus' attitude to ours, they don't look too highly on themselves. They they have a high esteem of someone else. Uh, Meekness is not merely having this low self-esteem and saying, woe is me, but it's having an accurate, an accurate depiction of oneself and who you are, as well as an accurate appraisal of those around you and esteeming them, holding them high. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Have you ever gone a day or maybe even just a meal without food? And you feel that deep sense of of hunger, that, that growing sense of dissatisfaction. Your entire body and mind and emotions are impacted by it. Jesus says, blessed are those who have that same kind of hunger and thirst but for this characteristic of the kingdom called righteousness. Righteousness is a declaration of not only what is right, but it is just this rightness about the kingdom. The king is righteous, and therefore he makes righteous judgments. And this hunger is this hunger for what is right, this hunger for justice, this hunger to be made right in our relationship between ourselves and others, ourselves and God. Blessed are those who, when it comes to deep down inside their heart, this is what they hunger for. This is what they thirst for. You're going to see righteousness play a a prominent role, a prominent theme throughout this entire sermon. And Jesus is going to say things as extreme as, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you have no, no place in this kingdom. That would have been jaw-dropping for his audience. The Pharisees were seen as those who were righteous. They prided themselves on being righteous, and yet Jesus is going to take it down deeper into the heart and say, I don't know that you hunger for righteousness down inside your very core of your being. Blessed are the merciful. Because we recognize who we are, and because we see the king for who he is, we extend mercy. Mercy experienced becomes mercy expressed. Blessed are the merciful. Why? Because they are his people. Notice how each of these traits, you could almost turn it upside down and say, blessed are those who look like Jesus. Blessed are those who are, have hearts that are cultivated to receive him and know that they need him. Blessed are the pure in heart. And so if righteousness is a key theme, so is this word heart. Over and over again, Jesus is going to cause us to evaluate our heart. And I know for us, the heart is kind of the seat of emotions. We talk about love and different, uh, even drawing the heart here has that connotation, that picture for us, maybe even a little bit childlike. But for Jesus and his audience, the heart was the very seat, the core of one's being, the core of one's personality and one's life. And so to be pure in heart is to be of one mind, to have a single focus, to have pure motivations, to be motivated by one thing. And ultimately that one thing becomes this allegiance to Jesus, to have his desire, to have his will, to pray the prayer, your will be done. That is to be pure in heart. He calls us to be a people who go deeper. He goes on, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who, like Jesus, bring restoration, bring people together. Notice again the crowd that it's here. It's it's people from all over, and, and Jesus is bringing them together around himself, and he does that throughout his kingdom. Jesus reconciles us and God and us and one another. And blessed are those who look like him, who are peacemakers. Blessed are perhaps when peace 
is not an option. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Now, not just persecuted because they they did something stupid, they broke the law. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because they stood and they did what was right, because they stood for Jesus. Blessed are you when others revile you, Jesus goes on. He makes it personal. Blessed are you when they persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you on on my account. We are his people. So these Beatitudes, they reflect who Jesus is as king. They paint a picture of the nature of his people. But they also give us this promise They give us this promise. In fact, many people have noticed that these Beatitudes give us really three perspectives. Number one, they cause us to look in. They cause us to look in ourselves and evaluate our heart. But they also cause us and inspire us to look forward. This would be what scholars would call the eschatological nature of these Beatitudes. They call us to look forward to a day when Jesus' kingdom would be ultimately established. We live in the now, but not yet. It is an inaugurated kingdom, but when it comes to its complete um, authority, Jesus has said, all authority is, is mine. And yet there's some features of it that we still anticipate. We look forward. And these also cause us in many ways to look up. They cause us to look upward. And and this look upward is an expectation, but also a look up that causes us to reflect who God is. So look again at these Beatitudes. Notice the, the perspective as we look in, as we look forward, as we look up. Blessed are the poor in spirit, we look in. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we're able to look up. Those who are poor will ultimately be given the kingdom, be given more than we could ever desire or want. Why? Because our God is a merciful God. He's a generous God. He is the benefactor. That's what everyone who was poor in the ancient world needed, a benefactor who gave them something they could not gain on their own. Ultimately, this kingdom is our inheritance because we're poor and he is gracious. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because we look forward to a day when they will be comforted. John says it this way in Revelation, when every tear will be wiped away from their eyes, they will be comforted. There'll be no more crying, no more death, no more pain. We look forward to that day. Now that comfort has a now but not yet sentiment to it as well, because we can even be comforted now with this hope, this expectation that he brings as our king, with the picture and the promise of the resurrection. We can, even in the midst of our mourning for our own sinfulness and our mourning for the world and our mourning for even those who have died, we can be comforted because of our king. We are his people. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit forward-looking. They will inherit the land. I know your translation probably says the earth, but Jesus is sitting there in the promised land. He's on a mountain and he's overlooking perhaps the Sea of Galilee. He's overlooking this promised land, this land of milk and honey. And he says this, the meek, not the Neros and the Herods and the leaders and the prominent, not those, but the meek, they will inherit the land. This promise that is God's promise for his people is culminating in this moment, this forward-looking moment. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for there will be a time, and there is a now but not yet, they will be satisfied. Jesus' cross and his resurrection brings us a righteousness that we could not achieve. It's this righteousness that is imputed upon us, that is given to us, We're satisfied, and yet we know that not is all right in the world and not is all right within ourselves. We long for still this righteousness that is by the very nature of who God is. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy, and we have received mercy, and yet we also extend mercy to others around us. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Throughout this sermon, we're going to challenge you throughout this this series, we're going to challenge you to get a picture, get a glimpse of who Jesus is, to evaluate our heart and to see him more clearly. 
I think these Beatitudes are a clear picture of saying, unless your heart looks like this, you're not ready to receive Jesus. You're not ready to see him. You're not ready to know who he is and, and how much you need him. Notice the contrast with the Pharisees who reject, reject Jesus. They would not describe themselves as pure in heart. They were not described as being meek. Those would not be pictures and, and descriptions they would adopt for themselves. And their hearts, for the most part, weren't ready to receive him. So we walk through all of these things. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they look like God. They'll be called children of God. They look like him. The persecuted. Why? Because again, it's framed up. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If we want to be his people, we evaluate our hearts. We look to him and we look in the mirror and we ask the question, are we ready to receive him? Do we know how much we really need him? The Beatitudes cultivate this soil and challenge us to pray the prayer, your kingdom come. First, inside of me.